Thank you for joining XR Om, which is India's first AR, VR, MR podcast. And today, I'm delighted to have with me Mr. Jeremy Dalton, who leads PwC's XR team. He helps clients implement virtual reality and augmented reality. He has also been featured in various uh, media such as Financial Times, The Economist, BBC, and others. He has worked with organizations like the World Economic Forum, and currently sits on the advisory board of Immerse UK to support businesses interested in immersive technology. So, Jeremy, it's a pleasure and honor to have you on Exaudum Podcast. First of all, thank you for giving time and being part of the show. So, you. Have your hands busy. You are lead PwC's VR initiative. You are also part of Immers as the Immers UK as the advisory. Board. And then, you, you, how did you make time to write a new book? You've written a book which is back there on your shelf. Reality check. I mean, it's getting rave reviews. So let's start with that. I mean, how do you do all these multitasking? What got you into virtual reality and your book, Reality Check? Sure, sure. So it's a real pleasure to be here, Eddie, and I appreciate the the invitation to speak and and to talk to your audience. Um, in terms of, let's start with the book. So Reality Check it has been a a very challenging project for me, given the time constraints, as you mentioned, of trying to perform all these other roles. And uh, in all honesty, you just try to carve out time where you can. So I would I would wake up you know early in the morning four four thirty a.m. I would start my commute into work uh, into London um, on the first train, and uh, I would then set up in uh, in the office and I would uh, um, I would start uh, you know writing bits and pieces uh, then. And when it was time to work, I would shut that down. I would do my work. I would then stay after hours to do some more writing. When it came to the weekends, I there were countless weekends where I spent morning till evening, uh, both days, just writing and nonstop researching and writing. I wrote over the holiday periods, so I wrote over Christmas, over New Year's, um, over bank holidays, um, and I even took extra holiday uh, to continue writing. So it was. It was with great difficulty that I managed to <laughs> to finally get the book out there, but I'm very relieved that it's it's now done and uh, you know people are are enjoying it. And uh, so that's really I'm really glad to see that. Also, you know, there are these people you know who give excuses, you know, because I I hear a lot, you know, coming from people who say, "Oh, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. I'm too busy." But you know, th- these are just excuses. I mean, if you want to do something, you have a desire and intent, you will always find a way. You said you used to get up. Early in the morning, 4:30 a.m. You know, and whether it was your holidays, Christmas, or New Year, or whatever. I mean, it's it's constantly being at it. You know, that quote. You know, when there's an ant who's trying to climb a wall, and he keeps on falling down. But you know, if he 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 is persistent, he keeps at it. There's nothing that can stop. Uh, someone from doing what he or she wants to do. So yes, I mean to my listeners, yeah, I think that's 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 the most basic thing as an entrepreneur, as an individual who wants to uh, create a preferred future in this world. So so would you and like to talk? Uh, sorry, uh, but would you like to talk a little bit more about the book? What 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 book is all about? Yeah, yeah, sure. Just before we get onto the book, Eddie, I want to touch on something you said. I I empathize with with people who who say that they don't have any time, and I get it. You know, the the modern world is full of all sorts of distractions and opportunities um, and activities that you can get involved in. There's a lot of expectation to be online all the time, um, so it's difficult. It's a really challenging environment, but my my advice would be for anyone that finds it useful or helpful, um, you want to try and minimize things that are valuable for you. So minimize distractions, get rid of as many notifications as possible from as many applications as possible. Um, you know, don't necessarily agree to everything, you know, say no to some things that don't fit with your strategy, with your vision. You may have to do things you don't like, sure, but um, you have to make sure you have to try and make sure that those match to what you are trying to achieve. So for me, the book was was a way for me to get down all of these thoughts and um and feelings that I was having and experiences in the XR industry over the last few years in terms of engaging with business stakeholders. So I speak to businesses across all industries, whether it's oil and gas, banking, healthcare, retail, sports, 
and so on. And there's just so much opportunity for the technology, but that opportunity is not always seen by business leaders. More often than not, there is a view that virtual reality and augmented reality is just for gaming, that it is only for entertainment, it doesn't have any business value. And I kept hearing this repeatedly, time and time again, from uh, executive board to middle management, it didn't really matter. You know, there were there was a fairly large contingent of people. Thankfully, that's getting smaller and smaller. Um, that had this wrong belief, this erroneous belief. So what I said is right. They need to be they need to be shown the value. How can I show the value? First of all, I can call upon case studies, you know, from their competitors and from other organizations that are using the technology. Secondly, I can call upon academic reports, you know, academic studies and journals showing papers, showing the uh, the value of the technology in different areas for soft skills training, for, for job skills simulation or hard skills, for, um, you know, for learning and development operations purposes. And so I said, right, I'm going to do that. I'm going to bring in the corporate cases. I'm going to bring in the academic uh, reports and studies. And uh, I'm also going to bring in some of the my own experiences of developing and deploying XR and some of the, the challenges we faced and how we overcame them. I'm going to put those stories in the book. Um, and then I'm going to talk about all of the misconceptions and why they're wrong. I'm going to talk about why it's not true. You know, not everyone gets sick in virtual reality. That's uh, it, it certainly has some truth to it, sure, but it's far more nuanced than that. And the reputation is far worse than the actual effect um, in the industry. And uh, it's, not, it's not scalable. That's what a lot of people think as well. It's very expensive. All of these things I wanted to put down and tackle one by one and provide this, this ammunition for not only business leaders to understand and take to their senior stakeholders around the value of the technology, but also for the XR industry, they found it really useful in terms of having all the information in one place that they can then use as a kind of you know, one key reference document uh, to help articulate the value of the technology to their clients and to other businesses. So that was my aim and sort of my my guiding light when when writing this book that helped me to keep going with it. It fit with my strategy to to educate uh, businesses worldwide on the value of the technology. You rightfully pointed out there is so much misinformation out there today, you know, largely being created about the, from because of the media, because there's media which kind of paints a picture of how oh, AR, VR, MR is this technology which can completely create transformation. And, and maybe then there is this little over expectation. Yes, this is the technology which can create huge transformation, but I guess we need to nurture it at this point in time because it's nascent stage is just trying to kind of figure out what it can do. Even now, there is so much real world value which has been adding on to businesses uh, across, you know, whether it's your in training, healthcare, education, even in India, I'm seeing some really good startups adding real, real, uh, you know, uh, good value onto the ecosystem. Now, uh, before we get uh, move along, uh, I would like to take a little, I mean, a backstory of uh, Mr. Jeremy Dalton a and what got you interested in virtual reality? Because I think it always starts with that, you know, because you are a passionate uh, evangelist, passionate entrepreneur who's fronting this e ecosystem in UK and globally. But what nudged you to do it? What was the reason? Why did you choose virtual reality? So I've always been excited by the potential of technology in general. And so I've always tried to nudge myself in that direction. If you look at my career path, it's really, it's really weird. So I, um, I studied mathematics at university, which is completely irrelevant from a virtual reality and augmented reality business perspective. Um, I then, I was a software developer for a little bit. I was teaching mathematics online for a little bit. I joined PwC back in 2011, and I actually joined in the audit department, believe it or not. So I was an auditor for a bit of time. And then I moved to business recovery, then I moved to consulting. And within consulting, I managed to find an area uh, or a team that, that worked in innovation. 
So they were charged with helping businesses understand the impact and the disruption that could be caused to their business model by emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, virtual reality and augmented reality, the Internet of Things, robotics, drones, and so on. And that was amazing because I got to see all of these different technologies and, and how fascinating they were and being able to be applied to different businesses in different ways. But it's you'll know this, Eddie, it's super difficult to keep in to keep track of all of the advancements in, in all of these areas, uh, you know, let alone just one area. It's really difficult keeping track on one area. But here we have, you know, eight, eight areas. Um, so what I said to myself is I really need to focus in on one particular area and become a specialist within that area. Then the question became, which area? Because there are so many, and I mentioned a few uh, just now. Um, I looked at all of these different technologies and I, I experienced them myself. I read about them. I, uh, I built some experience, some sort of applications with some of them to try and understand them. I saw how businesses were going to use them. I took futurist views on where they were going and how they could impact the world. And I have to be honest, virtual reality and augmented reality, immersive technologies, in other words, really unique area amongst all of that set of technologies. I found it I found it such an experiential, such a visceral technology that I had never seen before. Um, it was very different from other technologies because it was such a such a front end technology, a, a, for, uh, a front facing one where it's it's all about visual communication. It's about storytelling, um, and storytelling is 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 an attribute or a, a function of humanity that is as old as 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 humans themselves. You know, ever since we've had humans in the world, uh, more than one anyway, we've had the desire to communicate and to tell stories, whether that's for information purposes, for educational purposes is for, um, you know, entertainment purposes. It's all about storytelling. And this technology is the latest medium or advancement in the realm of storytelling. And I thought to myself, I really want to be part of that journey as we start to build this technology out and use it not only in the professional world, the enterprise world, but also in the consumer world, in our personal lives. You know, when when smart glasses become a thing, when smart contact lenses become a thing, when all of when it when it permeates through our lives, so that we are using it every day without thinking about it, like a mobile phone, for example. I like you am super excited about XR. I got into AR VR back in 2016 when. Uh, uh, a client of mine asked me if I could build content for them. And I realized that this medium can take us into the next evolution of storytelling, you know, from, you know, we can, we'll be able to break away from a 2D boundaries and get into the 3D world and exactly interact with things with how we interact with things in the real life. So I, yes, I'm super excited of what AR, VR, MR can do. Now, pandemic last year everybody was confined to home and there has been a overload on content and you miss uh, you, you you mentioned that you know i mean because of o overload of content we need to minimize distraction i guess that's the only way to kind of build things that uh, or or go in a zone which is more preferred uh, to us now tell me how do you see covid or the pandemic impacting AR, VR, MR? Because, you know, we've been talking about uh, remote healthcare, remote education, uh, remote work, and AR, VR, MR is that tool which has got all the capabilities built in. The impact of, of COVID on XR has definitely been, it's been positive uh, in that because everyone's been forced um, in lockdown or forced to uh, to work remotely and, and collaborate remotely, it's presented an opportunity in the form of a new technology that enables us to work together in a more effective and an efficient way. So that's been that's been good. Um, personally, from firsthand experience, we've I've seen more interest from clients to discuss virtual reality and augmented reality, and I think that's really positive. 
we are we're not only seeing the initial uh, conversations increase in number, but we've also seen the number of conversions from conversations to actual executed projects increase as well, and that's been great. Um, what I would say though is that COVID is not the reason for virtual reality and augmented reality success or adoption in the mainstream, whether we're talking about the corporate world or the consumer world. It's certainly been an accelerator, a catalyst uh, for, for getting, for opening the minds of business leaders to the value of this technology, as well as others, and, and even non-technological aspects as well in terms of different ways of working. And that's been positive for businesses. You know, they've, they've been forced to, uh, to digitally transform whether they like it or not. Um, but even when COVID subsides and becomes less of an issue in the world, the value of virtual reality and augmented reality will still remain. Because if you think about it, whenever we need to work remotely, um, whenever we need to, to work and we can't come together face to face because of financial reasons, time reasons, health reasons, whatever it is, there needs to be an alternative for this technology for uh, to be able to conduct that work. And virtual reality and augmented reality represent a very powerful alternative to face-to-face -face collaborations, meetings, workshops, um, and the like. So I see, I see an increase, in summary, I see an increase in interest in XR as a result of COVID. Uh, which perhaps will not be as intense once COVID drops off, but it will certainly, the XR industry will still certainly continue to grow as the use cases will remain even beyond COVID. So how is PwC leveraging XR in house? And would you like to share some use cases or, or works that you have built with PwC? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We've got a lot of exciting stuff. I mean, we use... We use virtual reality in, in real estate, internal real estate, to, to visualize our office environments and uh, manage any changes, refurbishments, uh, new building purchases, whatever it is, new locations, uh, movements, all of that sort of stuff. Our real estate team uses virtual reality uh, to provide that extra dimension of visualization, that accurate one-to-one -one scale. Uh, visual. And uh, we also have our student recruitment team that are using, I, I would, I'd more describe it as virtual worlds. And um, they are using uh, virtual worlds to engage students from all over the UK. And we've had, you know, nearly 10,000 students come together on, on a virtual campus uh, to meet with us and our different lines of service. Uh, we use virtual reality for training purposes. So we train our tax team on uh, commercial acumen and other areas using VR. We use it to immerse business leaders in cybersecurity attack simulations. So this is one that's being headed up by our cybersecurity department. We use uh, virtual reality for meetings, for workshops, uh, for brainstorming sessions, uh, important client engagements where there is a, a value to using the technology. So for example, we work with, with companies from all over the world, but this particular one I'm thinking of was a furniture manufacturer. And we brought in some of their 3D models of their, furn their new furniture into the virtual world at a one-to-one -one scale so that we could all explore it from different angles and understand it better and get a proper, uh, a better view on the business and their products as a result. And I'll tell you um, about one more application that we're, we're using it for, and that is in the area of um, uh, diversity and inclusion. So unconscious bias and managing that and helping to, to mitigate against that. So this is one of the latest projects that we've produced, and I released some information about it uh, online um, just a few days ago. But this is using a very special technology called volumetric capture. So for those of you who don't know, volumetric capture is kind of a, it's like a three-dimensional video. So instead of taking a 2D video of someone, you're using, you know, hundreds of cameras potentially all around you to capture a three-dimensional model of someone and then applying a texture or a skin which looks photorealistic because it is effectively like a video of someone that you're slapping onto the 3D model. And the result is really, really impressive because you get the depth, you get to have the completely three-dimensional 
uh, person that can be implemented in virtual reality, augmented reality, and other applications. But uh, you also get that sense of photorealism as well. So volumetric capture is an area that uh, I'm very excited about, and I I talk about it whenever whenever I get the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think once virtual reality matures and we get into volumetric video, the world I think will completely transform. I remember when I got into virtual reality back in 2016, we were doing 360 videos, and it was so cumbersome at that point of time, you know. And then from there, my client pushed me to do stereoscopic VR, and I was like, "Wow, this gets more difficult because you know, I mean, rendering time, you know, takes days at that point of time." And then now we're scratching the surface of volumetric video with haptic feedbacks, interactive storytelling, you know, just to describe people that what can happen, you know, I mean, to content, what storytelling. I mean, it's it's I'm full of excitement because. Yes, it's very difficult to kind of, uh, you know, I mean, make somebody who's uh, using the traditional medium of, to make them understand what this is going to look like in the next few years. But I hope that the world sees that technology is growing exponential, exponentially, and most of the traditional businesses, if they do not. adopt and adapt technologies they will be left be- behind you know so they need to start looking at these new tools that we have and, and look at the opportunity they present and start leveraging it because they, there is this whole conversation of reskill upskill and being lifelong learners and i guess that's the only way for a individual or business to survive in this future which is going to be extremely competitive and where automation is going to be a huge thing because because of covid we've got into social distancing and because of social distancing there's going to be automation there's going to be job loss so uh, the only way to prepare yourself is to be lifelong learners now jeremy would you want to explain to my audience what spatial computing is and how artificial intelligence 5g and iot will be enabling xr and spatial computing so everyone's got their own definition of spatial computing but i think a good way of thinking about it is considering what computing looks like now so traditionally if if i were to ask the question you know what is computing to you or what is a computer you might point to your laptop you might point to your desktop uh to your tablet to your phone to your mouse and keyboard and that would make total sense you know that is the way we interface with computers at the moment and the digital world perhaps at a more abstract level we type on a keyboard we use our mouse uh we operate on a on a small 2d screen in front of us and we we play around with elements on that flat 2d screen now moving that dimension to spatial computing as the name might suggest this is when you start to take things out of that single plane and you start to bring them into the three dimensional space around you so thinking about how this and and this has very strong connections obviously to virtual reality and augmented reality because in virtual reality you are in three dimensional space you feel it you feel immersed in this completely different environment in augmented reality you are still in the room around you but you are being given information and objects in that real world environment through the power of augmented reality so again in the space around you whether that space is digital in virtual reality wholly or only partly digital in augmented reality that is the world that we are moving a lot of a lot of material to and hence the 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 term spatial computing as we start to figure out the nuances of how we interact in that world because the way we interface with technology and spatial computing is or may be very different from how we do it with traditional computing um when it comes to the the use of spatial computing in um in the future there are so many different application areas that you can uh, that you can uh, get involved in and so it represents a really exciting uh, dimension for us to start interfacing with the technology but not one that will replace 
traditional computing in my view. We're not going to move everything to spatial computing. In the same way that currently we use a, you have a laptop and maybe you have a phone or a tablet as well, and you use those where it makes sense, right? You don't all use your phone all the time. You don't use your laptop all the time, but you may use your phone when you're on the move, uh, when you're in public transport. You may use your laptop when you have an office set up, when you have space, when you have a desk, when you have power. Um, in the same way, we may take out our virtual reality headset in the future and use it when we have a workshop with 20 people from different parts of the world, but we really need to engage and understand each other at a deep level. So that's how I see uh, spatial computing in the future. It is a part of our interface with the digital world, but not the only interface. Um, so in my view, 5G, I think, is very exciting for virtual reality because it allows us to lower the latency and increase the bandwidth. And that's incredibly important because there is a lot of data that needs to be pushed out with virtual reality worlds. If you think about um, how much data we have on a, on a small 2D screen and the fact that we now have to have data for everything around us, and uh, if we're talking about um, uh, data that is that is uh, perhaps um, that allows you total freedom, then we have to we have to have data relating to the entire environment in three dimensions. So there's a lot of data there. It needs to be given to you in a very quick manner. So that's why we need la latency to go down so that when you move your head, the virtual world moves with you very quickly so that you can avoid, you know, the, the stereotypical view of virtual reality making everyone sick. It certainly was a very, it was a very bad situation back in the early 90s in that era of virtual reality. And sadly, that, um, that reputation has pervaded throughout even now the current times in VR. But it's gotten much, much better, thankfully. But um, 5G, I don't see necessarily as an enabler for virtual reality. I think virtual reality is already proving its value without 5G. And we will have to wait for, for a few years before 5G becomes so mainstream that it becomes a reliable tool to be used within, within a virtual reality experience. So I'm not necessarily very bullish about the short-term impact of 5G, certainly more about the long-term impact, but we might have to wait many years for that. As for the other technologies, this point about convergence is really important. The idea that you have the concept of the Internet of Things and augmented reality, for example, coming together to create a, an experience or an application that is greater than the sum of its parts. So put another way, if you have, think about the Internet of Things just on its own, you think about augmented reality just on its own, those two are great, but when you put them together, that's when you get even more enhanced value. For example, when you are, let's say, inspecting a warehouse as an operator of some sort, you're wearing augmented reality glasses. All you have to do now is glance at a machine and then the data from the machine, uh, it can, first of all, the glasses recognize what machine you're looking at. The data from the machine is transferred to a server and then sent back down to your glasses, presenting you with a view on the the maintenance procedures of the machine, the last service date, the current running state, all of that real-time information uh, given to you as a result of combining these two technological concepts. And you can apply that to many different combinations and permutations, but that will hopefully inspire you in thinking what other combinations could be really valuable out there. How cool is that? We're just scratching the, the what this technology or tool we can do in a few years. Uh, I, from my vantage point, I think it will be a must-have tool for all possible or all businesses you know, across. So, so what's the most interesting problem you have solved leveraging uh, XR for uh, with PwC? So there are a few problems we solved, and I would summarize them by saying some of there are some of them are remote visualization issues. So if you think about this, I'll give you a real life example. We worked with a company that had operations based in New Zealand, and they were looking to sell uh, a stake in their company to, to individuals. And we were brought on to help find uh, a buyer. 
uh, to, to purchase. Now, the issue is for them to actually see the operations firsthand, they would all have to fly, all the different buyers would have to fly from all over the world to New Zealand. And that's that's difficult. Wherever it is in the world, you know, traveling is 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 always a a point of friction, right? But with virtual reality, we were able to give them a view of the assets and the environment and the procedures around that organization uh, through a, a virtual reality headset, and that was fantastic in being able to give them a a vision of that company and help to to create some more confidence in their purchasing decision within that company. So that's one example. Um, Another example would be around education when it comes to a cybersecurity attack scenario. So a lot of organizations don't really understand what it is like to go through a cybersecurity attack but we don't want to we don't want them to have to go through an actual cybersecurity attack so what we've done is we've created this simulation in virtual reality that we then and this is this is a real example we presented this to 300 uh people in 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 Canada in Toronto this was about maybe one and a half years ago nearly two years now um and it was 300 people simultaneously in the hotel put on these headsets entered the scenario and had to make real life decisions about what they would do, you know, in that situation. So they made decisions like, do I pay the the, the Bitcoin payment on the ransomware attack or not? And the, the amazing thing is we collected all of that data consensually, of course, and um, we presented it back to them right after the experience. So 15 minutes later, they took off the headset and right in front of them in that room, we had information relating to all of their decisions in aggregate and how they went about that that kind of professional choose your own adventure cybersecurity attack simulation. So that was a great way of providing that education on 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 cybersecurity issues that is, in our opinion, very effective and potentially even more effective than just talking to them about it and presenting a slide deck around it. You mentioned about the cyber security use case. I mean, eventually, I think, you know, when we have like a head wearable device, which compels you to wear it for the entire day, I keep on having a conversation that in, in that world, what, you know, wherever you're walking, whatever you're looking, whatever you're looking at, everything is going to be, you know, captured. And we have become so careless about the data. Today, I think some of the biggest companies in the world are squeezing the data out of everyone and, and creating you know, big technologies and tools. Obviously, these, these technologies are great things. You know, it, it can open up uh, to education, which could be free away from or, or, or rote education. It could help open up for, you know, healthcare, remote healthcare, remote training and so many. How important is the role of of privacy? Should we have more conversation on that and start educating people that AR, VR, MR, obviously is this new thing. Artificial intelligence obviously is the new, is the most awesome technology tool that we have with us at this point in time. But there, there's this other side. I think we need to have a conversation. Take the entire community along, you know, and not just have these big techs decide for us because most of the these big tech companies are squeezing data like you know they squeeze the uh, the sugar cane and harvesting it you know so what are you used for something like that I think you're absolutely right Eddie um, privacy has has always been a, a big issue but it's now become a, a, a much bigger issue in the digital age and with the advent of new technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality it has become an even bigger issue because of the the sheer amount and an invasiveness or or depth of the data that you can collect once you have got a a device a wearable device on your face potentially tracking things like your eye movements your lip movements your facial expressions your height the way you the way you pick up objects the way you walk you know there are so many aspects of data now that are coming into the net that uh, were not available to these large organizations before. So there definitely needs to be more conversations between all these different stakeholders. There needs to be 
more pressure on larger organizations to be more responsible with data, to be more transparent with the data, and to be more, to provide functionality that allows users to control their data in a more uh, efficient and an effective and transparent way. And by that, I mean giving users the ability to decide what part of their data is used and to choose whether they provide that data or not. And not to, uh, not to unreasonably withhold the service that the organization is providing as a result of the user not being willing to give that data up. What do you think can be done to create an ecosystem or a bridge around the world where you know we push by the conversation of collaboration to nudge the ecosystem because it, it, even right now i mean ar vr we, we talk about it but then adoption is, is still slow what can be done to create an ecosystem you know for mass adoption of this technology i think the ecosystem has to come from multiple levels so it has to come from uh, partly from government supporting it in the form of it could be tax reliefs, it could for for innovative technology um, advancements and research and development, it could be programs at uh, at an educational, a college or school level or university level that promotes the next generation of the the talent pipeline into the industry. It could be courses at university that help better prepare students who, who know they want to specialize in VR and AR technology and giving them the skills uh, very quickly uh, in, in a sort of concentrated form so that when they enter the industry, they are able to hit the ground running. I think there is there are opportunities to provide grants to solve problems that, uh, that that virtual reality and augmented reality could be used um, and where they fit very well. Uh, I think there are opportunities for industry to start um, exploring the technologies more and trying to test and pilot things. You know, XR doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to spend millions of dollars on, on implementing a, a program in your organization. You can start small with a small pilot program and you can build up from there once the value has been proven. Um, so I think there's that's industry, that's government. From the end user perspective, I think us as people, uh, we have a say in terms of our concerns for the technology. Um, and in, it's important that we have a voice in, in the industry and we make it known as to where we would like to see uh, more examinations and investigations and studies uh, to give us greater assurance when using the technology. So I think it's it's a multifaceted approach. But if you bring all these stakeholders together, and of course, I didn't mention manufacturers as well, but they have a, a duty in a way to ensure that their products are, um, are, are, are being used in the most appropriate manner or they're being built in the most appropriate way. Um, and bringing all these stakeholders together is is part of of creating that ecosystem. So everybody plays a little part to make it to make it better, to build it up further, and ensure that it has a sustainable future. How can enterprise leverage XR? And the ones who are not looking at it, what would you tell them? So think about XR as a a tool, a tool that can I that can solve a problem. Now, problems for organizations can be problems right now. You know, it's, it's very easy to identify when we, we have an issue in an organization, um, or at least let's say it's easy to communicate it once you know about it. But what about problems that are in the future? So they're not current problems, but they're future problems waiting to become an issue. Now, those, sometimes we call them opportunities because it's an opportunity to and to create an efficiency right now that will become a pressure later on when all of your competitors are using the technology and you are the odd one out that is now lagging behind as a result of not having adopted or experimented with the technology. So think about engaging with XR as a tool that can solve your current problems or as an opportunity to solve future problems. But be patient with it. 
uh, don't don't worry about having to, um, as I mentioned before, spend millions of dollars on it, but do spend something on it. You know, you need to put some money into it, right? To be able to understand and, and, and benefit from the learning, right? Run a pilot program in your organization. Start with a small team, a, a single office, a single use case and application that you feel very strongly about. Learn from it, uh, update it, iterate it, go into version two, version three. Once you have done all that, it won't have cost a lot for the knowledge that you will gain and you will be able to use either way. If it fails or succeeds, you will have knowledge that you will be able to use going into the future. Take linear steps. And you know, there is there is so much misconception out there that AR, VR, MR is expensive. It is expensive, but not as much as I think how the media has painted. But the value that it's adding is humongous. And you said something very interesting, that future problem. You've got to be, be prepared for it. And you said it, it, those are opportunities. And I think if people understand that, that the ones who have foresight will be able to build better businesses, will be, be, be better prepared because... I think the entire world failed miserably when it came to COVID. You know, neither the leaders, neither the countries, nobody was prepared. But I think you said that that's so very profound. But I hope people understand that, you know, if you can be prepared for future pro- problems, you are future-proofing yourself, you know, and how cool would that be? And I think that should be like the most basic and most important thing for any businesses to go forward because we are getting into a world where all of these technologies are maturing. Maybe in this decade, we could have a wearable device. Maybe in this decade, we we could have Apple, Facebook, and some of the other brands coming up with glasses compelling you to to wear, wear this because not you will be able to leverage all the opportunities which is being presented by the spatial world, you know, because all your physical objects will give you data which you can leverage and create better uh, uh, frameworks for your businesses. Uh, reality check. What comes next after that for this that one? So I'm I am wondering about this because it was a very painful experience writing this book, but at the same time it was very rewarding as well. And uh, and so as time passes, you tend to forget the pain of uh, of previous experiences anyway. <laughs> so I'm already thinking now about what is the next book, and uh, I think it's it might actually look at the past. So this book looked at the present. There are lots of books that look at the future. But I think there are too few books that look at the past with regard to virtual reality and augmented reality, thinking about where it came from, uh, where its roots lie, for how far into the past has it been, has this idea of immersing yourself in a completely different environment, for how long in humanity's history has that been pursued? And exploring all those different aspects around storytelling, um, and, uh, and and the fascinating history, once you get into the, the digital side of the technology, once it started to become a digital device, um, and building that, that story up that people can get excited about, even though, even if they may not be in the XR industry, that's something that is, uh, that I'm looking at right now and exploring. Thank you, Jeremy. It was really a pleasure and honor to have you on the show. And to my listeners, the if you like what you see here, please press the subscribe button. Until next time, so you can see that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. We really appreciate this. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, everyone.